Good afternoon. I'm Elizabeth Alexander, president of the Mellon Foundation, and I am loving watching all of you saying hello in the chat from so many different places. Keep it coming. We're so honored that you decided to join this conversation and be part of it today. And thank you for your patience with us getting started. We want to know who you are, where you're watching from, and if you have questions for our speakers today. We are always really, really excited. We found that as we do more and more of these programs, the richness of what happens in the chat is a part of the conversation. Uh, it's all of a piece. So today I am very, very honored and excited to convene this conversation about mass incarceration in the United States, the toll it takes on us all, and the liberatory power of the arts and humanities to counter the isolation and inhumanity of the interconnected and discriminatory structures of prisons, jails, immigrant detention centers, policing, prosecution, and probation. Last week at the Mellon Foundation, we publicly launched a $125 million initiative called Imagining Freedom, which aims to make visible and audible the experiences of people impacted by the criminal legal system. More than 70 million people in the United States have been arrested, prosecuted, or convicted of a crime. Nearly half of all Americans have a relative who has been incarcerated. And nearly one in five children in the United States has a currently or formerly incarcerated parent. Which is to say that whether we realize it or not, the criminal legal system impacts all of us, the collective we. Through this initiative, we're aiming to support those who are system impacted in their artistic practice and humanistic learning, thinking, and knowledge building and sharing, and to strengthen and expand broader creative and intellectual communities. As we move forward in this conversation today, which is a part of uh, and, and a big public moment in our launching Imagining Freedom, and we can think of no better way to do it. I would like to acknowledge those who are currently incarcerated, who may not be with us physically or virtually, but who are nevertheless alongside us. And not right now, but we're working on a way to uh, make this uh, available to others. Joining us today to discuss how the arts and humanities drive opportunities for civic, scholarly, and creative engagement across the criminal legal system are our four extraordinary guest speakers. Dr. Gina Dent, Dr. Angela Davis, Mitchell S. Jackson, and Jesse Crimes. I am so excited. Oh, there you are. I am so happy to see all of you and so excited that, that we are here together today. And so let me tell our audience a little bit about each of you. Dr. Gina Dent is a renowned scholar and expert in Africana literary and cultural studies, legal theory, and popular culture. The author of numerous publications, including the forthcoming book, Prison is a Border. She is an award-winning associate professor of feminist studies, history of consciousness, and legal studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Dr. Angela Davis is a globally celebrated activist, scholar, and philosopher. She is the author of many groundbreaking texts and a distinguished professor emerita in the history of consciousness and feminist studies at the University of California, Santa Cruz. Through her words and deeds, she has become a global icon for freedom and justice and rights. Mitchell S. Jackson is a professor and writer whose publications include fiction, memoir, and the Pulitzer Prize winning, winning Runner's World article, 12 Minutes and a Life, an extraordinary account of the murder of Ahmad Arbery, and so much more. That doesn't even really begin to describe all that is in that amazing essay. A former Guggenheim Fellow and recipient of the Penn Hemingway Debut Fiction Award, he currently teaches creative writing at Arizona State University. And Jesse Crimes is an artist, curator, and co-founder of Right of Return USA, the first national fellowship dedicated to supporting formerly incarcerated artists. His work as a visual artist has been celebrated in museum spaces, ranging from MoMA PS1 to the Palais de Tokyo, 
and cited in various media outlets, including NPR and the Wall Street Journal. And we'll have a chance to see some of it today. Gina, Angela, Mitchell, and Jesse, my heart is bursting out of the screen. We welcome you and we thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for having so, me. So, of course, of course. Um, so I'd like to begin by um, asking each of you um, in turn to tell us about your primary life space, your primary place of life, and how and where mass incarceration exists or does not exist in that space. What kind of knowledge and awareness do members of your community where you live have about mass incarceration? And anyone who would like to start. Gina, why don't I start with you? All right. Um, I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm so thrilled about this initiative. And I am speaking from unceded Ohlone territory. I'm in Oakland, California. Um, I live here in a place that actually has been a center for abolitionist organizing for a long time. Um, I'm in the place that uh, developed critical resistance in the place that had the Prison Activist Resource Center, the Legal Services for Prisoners with Children, um, the Ella Baker Center, Creative Interventions, many organizations that have been uh, built over time to try and address the needs of those who are currently incarcerated and to enable others to exchange with us in ways in the free world. So, um, in our community, the issues of mass incarceration are well known. Uh, we had recently had a successful campaign by the Black Organizing Project to remove police from schools, which was a really, really important uh, first move. We also have a very robust restorative justice environment here. And uh, so the Bay Area has been um, an incubator of uh, many of the contemporary thinking around incarceration. On the other hand, um, it's also a space where there is now um, the representation of people who are um, fighting to change our criminal legal system in office. And there's also a lot of public uh, concern around this and uh, agitation. And so it will be interesting to see how we move through this next period. And I think the work of creatives and artists is going to be absolutely essential to allow us to do that. Thank you. Mitchell. Uh, yeah, I'll jump in. I, um, I, I live and teach in Phoenix, um, so Arizona, which has for years, you know, been a kind of uh, test case for um, for-profit prisons. And, um, and, I, and I was just reading up uh, on an article, actually it was published last year, where the head of the DOC, told legislators that the um, several communities in, in Arizona would collapse, that was his word in quotes, collapse if they didn't have uh, the prison um, system there. Mm -hmm. So so that I think that is really telling of how um, prisons operate in that space. I will also say I'm from Portland, Oregon, very proud Portland, Oregon native. Um, and so my when you take, talk about home and space, it's it's really Portland that I'm I'm thinking of, and uh, I was both heartened and uh, maybe disheartened um, last election when we voted out uh, language that um, from the Constitution that 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 um, criminalized uh, or that allowed slavery for um, people who had been convicted of a uh, of a crime. Uh, and then I looked at the uh, the, the exit polls, and forty five percent of Oregonians voted to keep it in. Um, so, so that also was very telling to me of the kind of um, holistic view of of my state and the place that I call home. So, uh, both of those um, two things tell me that there's a lot of work to be done uh, in the places that I reside and, and that are dear to me. Thank you, Angela. Well, I also live in Oakland, California, and um, I feel privileged to be able 
to to have been able to witness the growing um, collective awareness of the central role that um, imprisonment plays in producing and reproducing um, structural racism. Uh, I think I want to emphasize the fact that Oakland, California is where the Black Panther Party was founded. And if one looks at the uh, uh, number eight on the Black Panther Party's 10-point program from way back in 1966, uh, uh, that uh, point uh, emphasizes um, um, the importance of, of, of looking at uh, prison and places of incarceration. Uh, it says, we want freedom for all Black men held in federal, state, county, and city prisons and jails. And also, you know, perhaps I should say that um, I spent approximately two years, um, first of all, making myself unavailable to the FBI, uh, which is how we describe my period of being underground during my trial. Uh, and He's I spent available. time <laughs> making myself unavailable to the FBI. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I spent um, almost two years um, in three different jails and um, on trial. And then um, I, um, I was on trial for three charges, all of which uh, carried the death penalty. Uh, and, and since I'm talking about the, the his, his historical space, um, I should say that I feel very fortunate to have been able to participate in the organization National Alliance Against Racism and Political Repression, which fought for the freedom of political prisoners, and Critical Resistance, which is a movement that um, Gina and I uh, worked with uh, um, since the late 90s, uh, which has been central to the development of a collective awareness of the damages produced by uh, incarceration and the development of an abolitionist perspective that urges us to imagine new ways of addressing the problems that prisons presume to, but can never effectively address. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Jesse. Yeah, so I'm currently based in Philadelphia, which um, I mean, may still be the most incarcerated city in the country. Um, if not, it's probably number two. Um, and so, you know, I'm based here. I My studio is here. Um, and I think that, you know, obviously, uh, Larry Krasner is here. There is a lot of work that I think is being done in this community specifically to lower the incarceration rates. Um, I think the racial disparities in the city are also some of the highest in the country when it comes to incarceration. Um, but I'm also, I also split my time between here and Lancaster, Pennsylvania, which is where I'm from. And it's very much like a rural part of PA. Uh, so we often kind of joke about like Pennsylvania being like Pennsylvania, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I'm like, I'm very kind of cognizant of, of transitioning back and forth between these worlds because in like you were you were talking about those numbers earlier of like one out of every two people has an immediate family member who's been incarcerated right that's true in lancaster um but it's really interesting to me because the conversations that are being had in philadelphia are not necessarily the same conversations that are being had in lancaster in fact they're, they're not really being had that much at all um and so, you know, I, when we're when I think about like place and kind of like the the spaces that I occupy, both like where I'm from, which is also like home of the Amish and Mennonites, which have a very strong restorative justice practice. Um, but again, it's like those things aren't kind of translating into the real world, um, at least in that location as they exist today for the broader community. Um, so I think about myself as a visual artist and like how I occupy space and how to create work and basically like bridge the kind of movement and advocacy space with the art world 
and use that as like a tool to kind of bring community together. Um, so that's that's kind of like how I think about uh, space. Thank you all. Thank you. Um, Angela, I wanted to talk with you about um, the language and the terms that are used to discuss the urgent justice issues of policing, prisons, the legal systems are have developed over time. I think about uh, perhaps 25 years ago when you were talking about mass incarceration, prison industrial complex, uh, the carceral state, uh, that you know, human caging, that this language, these phrases that are so useful to so many people now, we're not always we're not always so. So um, I would love you to talk about uh, language and moving useful language into uh, wider usage and uh, how you think about uh, the importance of, of having clear language that exactly states what we're talking about. Um, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, and of course, language is always central to our efforts to engage in projects of uh, radical social transformation. Uh, uh, and um, I think of mass incarceration as a term that was popularized by M Michel Alexander, <laughs> uh, uh, mm -hmm. by the way. Uh, and, and that term helped to introduce new ways of thinking about the role of the police and prisons and in maintaining structural racism. Um, but of course, a critical take on new vocabularies would also require that we uh, recognize that a term like mass incarceration can also lead people to assume that we need smaller scales of mm -hmm. incarceration, uh, which can lead to the idea that only people who deserve to be in prison should be there. You see what I'm saying? Uh, yep, um, yep, yep. So, uh, you know, early on, uh, and I want to talk just a bit about the experience of critical resistance, which is an, a collective experience. We, we recognize, um, you know, all of us were abolitionists, but we recognize that abolitionist ideas would only resonate among a relatively small number of people. So a group of us decided that we should um, nevertheless work on changing the way people think about incarceration uh, by, by introducing new vocabularies. And as a matter of fact, that was a workshop at the founding conference, uh, a workshop mm -hmm. on new vocabularies. And we decided that um, the term prison industrial complex, which had already been used uh, by um, Max, by um, 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 Dave, uh, Gina, help me. Mike Davis. Mike Davis, uh, mm -hmm. which had been introduced by Mac Dave, Ma um, Mike Davis in an article he wrote about the transformation of California economy from an agricultural economy to a prison-based economy. So we decided to, to take on uh, that uh, term because it would allow us um, in the first place to disarticulate crime and punishment, uh, to argue that people don't necessarily go to prison because they have committed crimes, even when they have committed those crimes. That's not why they're in prison. They're in prison because of racism, because of class bias, because of heteropatriarchy, uh, because of capitalism. And the prison industrial complex, this term would encourage people to think about the, low, the, the, uh, the, the way in which global capitalism uh, has produced rising numbers of imprisoned people, deindustrialization, the dismantling mm. of the welfare state, and the use of a of the prison as a dumping ground for those who were rendered superfluous. And, and of course, uh, Ruthie Gilmore talks about surplus populations. Uh, um, and, and, and this produces also the acceptability of imprisonment uh, on the most superficial grounds. Uh, uh, um, so, yeah, uh, it, it, it was a central aspect of the work uh, we attempted uh, to do. Later, we began to talk about abolition feminism in order to mm -hmm. intervene into the anti-violence uh, movement. Uh, and dominant sectors of that movement were calling for more punishment for those who were 
uh, agents of gender violence. Uh, so, um, um, yeah, language is absolutely central. It, it can um, sh help to shift our uh, consciousness. Uh, and 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 during the present era, of course, uh, uh, we're attempting to talk about abolition in a way that um, will urge people to imagine different ways of addressing the problems that uh, the um, prison presumes to, but can uh, never uh, uh, effectively address. Uh, so new vocabularies are, are so central. And I thank you so much for, for assisting in this process of shifting the way in which uh, people think about uh, uh, carcerality in our society. Well, I think that for you know all of us in this conversation today, the great um, wide space here and ahead uh, is uh, the space of creativity, of imagination, of uh, of of sharing humanity in 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 that particular way, uh, of developing new modes of critical thinking uh, that come out of having to solve these problems from a different perspective than the outside, and so forth. So. Um, for you, Gina, this I, I wanted to know about your journey uh, a, as a scholar of African American literature and culture, and the evolution to the work that you're doing now. Mm. It's been a well, it's been an interesting road. <laughs> yes, I mean, I, I suppose it's an evolution. I I guess evolution is the right word because it feels to me entirely consistent with the way that I learned to think about Black literature. I learned about Black literature in a global context, not only in English, and um, that meant thinking about questions of borders, um, slavery, uh, conquest, uh, and um, of difference of various kinds. And so I was always dealing with fields of force and questions of power. And the cultural studies environment in which I came up uh, allowed that. And in fact, I studied law and anthropology along with literature in order to enable myself to address some of the issues raised in those literatures more directly. And so it became really obvious to me as I started to get working with prison issues more as an activist, um, that actually we needed to pay attention to these issues as scholars. Um, and I actually tried to do that. In fact, at Critical Resistance, I think one of the panels that I chaired was on visual culture in the prison, I believe, or something, visual culture in something. And so, you know, this was something that happened back in 1998. But mm -hmm. the truth was that I never thought it would be part of my research life, because as a humanist, it was um, understood that I would have nothing to contribute from that vantage point that would advance the thinking around incarceration. Of course, that really tells you how much has shifted, that we now, I think, fully understand that we need all of the various kinds of scholarship together, and not only scholarship, but activism and community building that will allow us to think about these issues in deeper ways. And in fact, the intractable issue of the criminal legal system can only really be addressed through the full disciplinary matrix that touches on all of the issues that the prison industrial complex presents for us. So I actually feel like it's entirely consistent in the work that I was trained to do, but it was work that was invisibilized um, in the university and in the larger context. And I'm thrilled to have been able to work with so many organizations over the years, but I'm maybe shocked that I'm living during the time when this is actually part of a broader public conversation and a conversation that can happen in a university context. And so I'm actually especially thrilled to say that um, my campus has just established a visualizing abolition studies curriculum. Um, and we are going to be training students through the arts and humanities to think carefully about how we receive the data on incarceration how we are inundated by an environment that 
um, tells us about incarceration every day in ways that we are not interrogating. And so I'm, I'm really, I feel that this is a natural evolution for me. And it's so important to address the global issues that I learned about maybe first from reading that literature. Thank you. Um, Mitchell, I'd like to hear just about, you know, it, it's a big question that's too big. Um, so you can answer it as concisely as you can. Um, and the question is you and language and words and writing. Um, just tell us the story uh, of, of how that came to be uh, uh, the thing you knew you had both to give, but also for yourself. Yeah, um, my, um, um, I don't even want to say love of writing, my introduction to writing um, or aspiring to be a writer uh, happened when I was incarcerated uh, in an Oregon prison. Um, I came home, I, I, I say it's an introduction because I didn't, I didn't really have a um, sense of what it meant to be a writer. That took uh, many more years for me to have that experience, but I did come home with some pages. And uh, one thing that I have always kind of prided myself on is um, having a really high value on craft and of, of learning um, what it meant to do the thing that I was going, or at least attempting to do. And so I ended up going to graduate school. And then that's where I kind of found out, um, you know, uh, what people were reading and, 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 and the techniques that people were using, but I, I, I really have to, um, give credit to mentorship. Um, one of the, uh, people kind of, well, maybe I, I pushed him into mentorship was John Edgar Wyman, who I hope is, is, mm. is a person most of this, uh, group knows, um, and has been really instrumental in, in my career, but also just an encouragement. Um, so I would say that, uh, coming to writing, um, was a kind of dream in the beginning. And, and it really took someone whom I respected and who had kind of already forged a pathway to, uh, to bring me to a place where I felt confident enough to pursue it. Cause there's so much disappointment. There's, um, there's so much time involved uh, in trying to make something on the page. And so, yeah, I, I think that's, that's really important. And I think also, um, you know, coming out of prison, you wanted things, or at least I did, I wanted things fast. And it was the reason why I ended up in prison in the first place. And, and, uh, and writing taught me a patience, um, that I didn't have before. Um, it taught me to examine my circumstances in a way I wasn't examining them before, um, especially writing nonfiction, right? That it really, uh, pointed me towards the history of my state and the racial covenants and the real estate covenants and the uh, the history of how black people were moved from one section of the city to another. And so all of those things really came out of uh, writing and mentorship um, and, and really having a kind of sustained um, vision for a way that I can impact um, people. Once I figured out that that I might be able to impact people or add some value to someone's life, that really, really fueled, um, you know, it, will add, it does fuel me every day at the chair. And and think back, going back to John Edgar Weidman, did was did he mentor you from his pages, or did you have a relationship with him? How did that happen? Yeah, in person, I studied with him over a summer at NYU, and. Uh, uh, I, I really pressed him. Like I literally said, Hey, I'm looking for a mentor, man. And, and he was like, I'm kind of busy. And, 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 and I put some more pressure on him. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he's been very encouraging. And one thing about, um, John that I really appreciate is he always tells me the truth and he's never mm. impressed. Right. He'll never just, like, even when I sent him 12 minutes in a life, he was like, that's nice. But did you think about this or did you think about that or did you think about approaching it like this? And I would have loved a little more of this. And so for me, you need someone who you respect, who's going to tell you the truth and who, you know, is doing it in your best interest, too. And so I'm, I'm really, really thankful to have him out here, not only still doing the work, but then also yes. um, looking out for me in that way. He's he, he's been a very important writer to me as well, and um, I think about um, all that. However long ago, 
Brothers and Keepers came out um, and, uh, you know, 35 years ago and how he gave the page, gave the voice to his brother, Robbie, who was inside. And 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 so that was their book together um, or in, you know, all of the Homewood books, the way that he writes about neighborhood always had a sense of people in, people out, people back, people forth, people connected to each other. Um, uh, not to mention those sentences. Uh, so, um, uh, I'm, I'm happy to, to, to think about and to hear you raise up his work. Um, Jesse, uh, we have, let's just dive right into some of the images that we have of your work, but also would like at what asking the same question about how you, um, how you came to, to making art. And we're going to get to look at some things. Yeah, and I, I was going to say, um, you know, since pretty much since the age of 13, I've transitioned through like nearly every facet of our criminal justice system, right? From like juvenile probation and jail to state prison to federal prison. Um, and I think the works that we're going to, are, are we going to put them up on the screen? Yeah, why don't, um, we, we, I think, why don't we put them up? Yep. So, so I think like, you know, kind of transitioning through all of those systems. Um, and like, you know, the, again, that's kind of like over a long period of time that those, you know, interactions were happening in these different spaces. Um, but in between that, I was also able to go to college and I had an amazing professor who really challenged me to think critically about the world, introduced me to um, Foucault's Discipline and Punish. And that like radically altered how I basically understood kind of my story and as like an anecdotal, like one off, like it's my failure. Um, but mm -hmm. like after reading Co, I very quickly began to realize like how this is a systematic problem, that this is something that is specifically being designed, right, for very intentional purposes. And so you know that my my last prison sentence i had literally just graduated like from college two weeks prior to that and then got indicted by the federal government um you know they caught me with a small amount of cocaine and ended up charging me with up to 50 kilos of drugs that never existed and they also placed me from the one jail that I was in into another facility and put me in solitary confinement for a year. And so like, I, I bring up that story because it's like, I, I think having kind of read Foucault and then going immediately into the system again um, with that kind of knowledge, which I didn't have prior, um, made me really think about how to use the materials of the prison against itself. And so for me, language is visual, right? Like every material has a very kind of specific language and how you, how you partner that material with other materials um, can say very different things. And it was very interesting to me because it's like, you know, most people are trained how to read and understand information, right? Like that's, that's pretty much what the school process is about, but like, there's no real education that is based on visual language and understanding that. Mm -hmm. And kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier, I actually think both visual language and the written word are equally powerful, right? They influence our decisions, our behaviors, what we see as beautiful or normal, or, or um, just all sorts of kind of societal norms that are based upon visual culture, right? And visual language. And so anyway, that's kind of the long way of saying like, when I was in prison, they were, I was reading the paper and there would be mugshots in the newspaper um, while I was in solitary confinement. And so I started to kind of remove those negative depictions of people from this one moment in their life and transfer them onto the surface of soap, um, which again, so prison issued soap, it like has the, all of the kind of, um, it has that latent language of like, uh, cleansing and purification and repentance, all of the things that the penitentiary supposedly is built to do. Um, mm -hmm. And so I transferred those images onto the soap. 
And then um, in the next slide, you'll see that I had to kind of smuggle these out of my cell. Mm. And so I started collecting used playing cards from other guys on the block who were would play poker through the bars of their cell. Um, and I would collect them and glue them together to create these containers to safely mail them out. Um, and, you know, so for me, it was like, thinking of ways to communicate with the outside world through the visual language of the prison. Um, mm -hmm. And then the next slide, I, I eventually um, fought the drug sentence, drug charges at my sentencing and was found guilty of like 500 grams. And so I got, I got a reduced sentence. Um, so instead of the mandatory minimum of like 10 years to life that I was looking at the judge, gave me a six year federal prison sentence. Um, but I went into the federal system and then had access to more materials. And so the piece that you're seeing on the screen is basically a recreation of an original work that I made when I was uh, in Farrington uh, Federal Correctional Center, where I was basically taking imagery out of the New York Times um, and transferring it onto the surface of prison bed sheets. And again, my thinking was like, you know, people are reading the New York Times, but they're reading the textual language, right? But they're not reading the visual language. So what happens when I remove all of the text and just transfer every single image in every single issue of the New York Times over a period of three years onto these prison bed sheets? And it was interesting what was reflected back, right? It was like a very white, saturated world. And it was a world that is like mainly features women as commodities, right, as objects. And so there are all of these kind of things happening in the world, but then they're mixed with commercial advertisements. And again, these things all kind of form norms and value systems. Um, and so that's kind of the, the works that I made when I was incarcerated. And we we have um, a, another slide, uh, Jesse, of Apoc Apocalyptine, I think. Could we put up the second slide? I think we have another one. Yeah. So that gives a sense of it in its whole space. And as I understand it, so this is Eastern Penitentiary. Is it the oldest penitentiary in the country? Yeah, so Eastern State, Eastern State Penitentiary is the first penitentiary in the country. Um, yeah. yeah, and so the, this, what you're seeing here, it's also a historic site now. And the director there yeah. is doing amazing projects really engaging with people and uh, through their programming but this is a installation that i basically kind of framed out an entire cell recreated the textures of the interior and then um, pretty much glued a recreation of the original onto the walls um, but because the original piece is 15 feet tall and 40 feet long it took me three years to make and smuggle out of the prison and so I didn't want to. I didn't want to end up gluing that onto anything. So that's that one's safely in boxes in my studio. <laughs> Thank you. It's it's amazing. It's amazing, Mitchell. You were going to read an excerpt of your work for us. Oh, uh, that's right. But I also wanted to add in the the vocabulary of returning citizen, which is not new new. But I do think you know when we think about mass incarceration in the prison industrial complex. It seems to me like we're looking down into a kind of a system. And I think the returning citizen is a way for a person who has been affected to kind of reimagine how they're looking out at the world, too. You know, when we think about what is this, what is citizenship? And I think that's really important. I'm, I'm sure maybe for Jesse and, you know, for me, if I had had that language, it, it probably would have given me a different vantage uh, back in 1998. Um, so yeah, so, so, so I wanted to add that you to, held on to that. You held on to re returning citizen. It was like, it was language that you held on to when you were inside as a way of thinking ahead. No, I'm, I, wish, I hope, I wish that I had it then. I, I wasn't even you aware wish you of had it. had it then. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe, maybe a, a decade or so ago. And I think, you know, out of that language, maybe we get to, you know, the restore restoring of, voting rights, you know, in Florida a few years yeah. ago. Like, I, I really do think that that language really does have power, but it's 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 a part of the language that feels like an individual looking out at the world or redefining themselves in the world versus us trying to give a um, give a category for a kind of broad systemic problem. 
um, which yeah. both of them obviously are valuable, right? But but I, I'm thinking like, what? How do? I, how would I have seen the world if I thought that I was a returning citizen versus an ex-con or a parolee? Yes, 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 yes. Yeah. Um, I'm going to read just a, a minute or so from uh, Survival Math, which is an essay collection um, about home. Uh, let's see here. We also homage the rose, the rose garden, rose quarter, rose bushes in the yards of homes in the West Hills in neighborhoods where developers build and open up to the public a new street of dreams every year, a street that is for someone else's dreams. Because the truth is some of us dream, but far too many dream small, realistic. And when those young dreams desert us, some of us start demanding by force things that ain't ours. Others move to Vegas to pimp, purchase a new ride and voyage home with the intent of triumphing down MLK. Those who stay local, those with aspirations average as shit, buy an abandoned faith, covet restored muscle cars with custom systems, exotic paint and wire rims with too many spokes to count. Others, Cop a sack from a big homie, a pre-cooked and acetone cut underweight dope sack and stand on a street grown folk warned us off of. Corners where young boys whose quivering flames were doused previous to ours carry stolen straps and grudges against the world. We posted on a hot block all night for damn near nothing. Only half of which, if we were lucky, was ours to keep. That was our cosmos. The reason there's been a hell of a chance of finding who we've been looking for in the justice center, if for weeks we ain't seen them on the streets. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Gina, I wanted to um, invoke a phrase that you've used, uh, carceral visuality. Uh, and hear some more about that and also use that to move into, I'm thinking about what um, Jesse was saying about visual thinking, visual language, and uh, thinking about the ways that language can empower and language can degrade. And what we also know is that for people who have certain learning challenges, for people who are uh, disserved by the school system, by by children who are disserved by society, sometimes words and writing and language uh, can feel very far away. Uh, and I, I wonder if there's a way that it's harder to get to visual intelligence, uh, you know, that if there were ways that we could nourish people's visual intelligence, that maybe that's not uh, quite as... Um, you know, tamped down and used against us uh, in the way that 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 language is. So that was a riff, but I would love to know what about that your use of that phrase and also about uh, the Jackie Samel project. Oh, yes. Um, so yeah, I I think I've used the term carceral visuality. Sometimes I don't recognize the terms I'm using, but um, to describe mm. the inundation. Uh, uh, that we are living with uh, of images referring to incarceration, either directly or obliquely. So, you know, how much of an effect is that inundation having on our lives? So Jesse was describing the visual language and so much of our visual language has been colonized by the criminal legal system. Not only our language that seems to refer to the horrors of incarceration, but even our liberatory language, or even as we're trying to understand incarceration, we live with carcerality. What do I mean by this? I mean, Angela and I have talked about the critical resistance organizing moment when people were trying to think about what to put on a poster. And mm -hmm. for abolitionists in the room, you know, the first thing that everyone was thinking about is bars and handcuffs, right? So how do we think about a visual language that actually suggests there's something more going on than just bars and and handcuffs, right? So what are the ways in which carcerality affects all of us, and yet we're not registering that it's affecting us? And then the second part of that is, as we're thinking about 
the problem of incarceration, even for people who are already focused on it, how do we disarticulate our visual exposures from the ways in which we're thinking about liberation? In other words, do we bring the things that we're learning by passively absorbing, passively absorbing all kinds of cartoons and films and TV shows mm-hmm. and news? How are we bringing those into our discussions about what's possible, what we can imagine in terms of the future? It's really felt to me that without addressing the popular cultural environment in which we're immersed um, in the ideology of the prison system, then we're really not going to be able to imagine a new reality, which is why I think artists and the arts have to be at the center of what we're trying to build and how we're trying to change. So, I mean, I I could go on and on about this because I think that we don't have a visual culture, a moving visual culture history without incarceration being represented. It's one of Edison's earliest films. It's known um, by many in the film um, uh, studies field is a reenactment of an execution. So, if we think about the entirety of our our visual history for the moving image, we're really looking at our weddedness to the language of incarceration. And so, you know, how do we move out of this? And so you raise Jackie Summel, who's an amazing artist who has been doing a project called Solitary Gardens. And Jackie uh, began this work um, with Herman Wallace, one of the Angola Three uh, who survived 40 years and more inside uh, Angola prison in Louisiana, a horrific prison that many of us know because of its particular historical role in the post-slavery context. And um, his incarceration um, was um, an incredible um, example of how someone, even in the worst possible conditions, can be working uh, for others, thinking collaboratively. And he ended up working with Jackie, who's a Louisiana-based um, artist, incredible artist who does what I guess we sometimes refer to as social practice art, which means that the art pro- project that we see as viewers is really just a manifestation of all of the work that she's been doing and building relationships um, before we see that work and the relationships uh, persist persist after the work is exhibited. So Jackie's work has been working with incarcerated people to imagine, especially in solitary, in the Solitary Gardens Project, to imagine um, what kind of garden they would build. In Herman's case, it was also a house. What kind of house would Herman build? down to every detail. So through a a series of exchanges, through letters over years, um, these projects have been built. Uh, UC Santa Cruz's project is working um, with uh, Tim Young. Tim Young is incarcerated at San Quentin. He's been in uh, on death row since 2006. And Tim saw himself even before he was incarcerated as an artist. He wanted to become an artist and he dreamed of becoming an artist. And he's been concerned with issues of environmentalism and other issues that he has thought about through art for many years. And so Tim and Jackie have produced the solitary garden that exists now on the UC Santa Cruz campus. And it's um, a beautiful space right in the center of the arts complex where um, we can walk through and meditate and see Tim's letters and see what Tim wanted to have planted and how Tim imagines uh, the world uh, he would like to live in and the world he lives in in his mind. You, we, we, you shared, we have um, uh, uh, with permission, um, one of his letters, uh, a bit of one of his letters, very um, just, I'll read. (laughs) My goal and my role is to make them see me. And in return, perhaps the universe will bless me with the type of camaraderie that is not fleeting. I am reminded of something that Jackie Summell wrote in the house that Herman built, where she said, transform your trembling into action. Move closer to those from whom you have averted your eyes. 
gift your eyes, your voice, and your freedom of movement to those who need them most. And then to describe the garden itself, he says, the area that I labeled as the patio, he says, I think the garden should be about inner beauty. The area that I labeled as the patio or veranda to me, that is the heart of the garden. The outer row was going to be about sugarcane and how it relates to slavery, mass incarceration, et cetera. The inner row, the crops, that's about sustenance. Anything of aesthetic beauty, I wanted that to be planted in the heart of the garden. As a prisoner, I have noticed that people tend to admire from afar. Rarely do they take the time to get to know you and or to discover your inner beauty. With the garden, I don't necessarily want people to be able to admire the roses, etc., from afar. If the sugarcane grows, it will act as somewhat of a barrier, and people will need to trek beyond the barriers in order to take in the garden's, the garden's inner beauty. And so you can see uh, uh, that. Uh, and, and as I understand it also, the plots that Jackie works with are the dimensions, or I, I've, I've seen some people say actually smaller than myself, um, but yeah. meant to mirror the di dimensions of, uh, of a solitary cell. Yeah. yeah. And, and I should also say about Tim that, you know, one of the ways we're also working with Tim is that, you know, we're not, we don't want to only support the art of Tim. We also want to support his struggle for freedom. And so um, we also have other um, scholars and artists who are working, uh, especially Sharon Daniel, who's got a project called Making Exoneree. And I, I want people to know that, you know, we, of course, want to exhibit the work of currently incarcerated artists, but we also want them free. And so um, mm -hmm. it's really important to to know that Tim is also actively working with us and and our film students are are making work that's helping to um, help his innocence claim and helping his appellate court case. And I think this is something that is often not seen when we're talking about some of this work, that there is a lot in the background that's happening that is so very important. And hopefully the way we're learning to see through these gardens is a route to engaging others to know how we can all be a part of this transformation. Um. Time is not our friend right now. So what I'm going to do is um, put a few of these amazing questions, which many of you can see just um, scrolling through. I'm going to throw a couple out there and whoever can take them and answer succinctly. And then we'll conclude with um, any kind of um, thought that each of you would like to leave us with. Um, so um, I saw a couple of great questions about archives. Uh, and about what would be a practical way that someone could uh, start doing community archives with incarcerated people. Um, uh, another question about archives, it was broader. What is the role of archives in understanding uh, mass incarceration? So that's one zone. I'm going to put a few out there. Uh, this question from Nina Tucker, what sort of personal liberation of the mind spirit politic needs to be prioritized in order to truly imagine freedom and liberate ourselves from that carceral conditioning? So that's another question. Uh, and then these are all so good. Um, a very simple question, but one that I think is um, a, a very important one to answer. Uh, this is from Navina Clark. How does college education in and out of prison help incarcerated people? What does this mean uh, for people once they come back home? So we have archives, we have spirit work, and we have uh, uh, college education, and anybody can jump in. So, I, I mean, the, the one thing that it, it immediately made me think of, um, because, and I also didn't get to really touch on this uh, earlier when we were speaking, is that, you know, so much a part of, of my practice is also the Right of Return USA organization, right? It is literally trying to think through how to build um, uh, systems of support and liberation for people who have been incarcerated, right? Specifically for formerly incarcerated artists. Um, and so we've been doing that work for the past five years, right? And we've gotten, I mean, 
yearly we average almost 300 applications right and this is like a, it's a very new kind of field it's an open application and so you know we've through this process like we've just been connected to this vast wealth of information um through people applying to be right of return fellows and it became very apparent to me um a number of different things within that is that you know we're dealing with a certain population of people mostly who have lost decades of their life right who have who have lost opportunities of connecting with an artistic community of of getting a college education like there are there are so many things that are kind of wrapped up into what the carceral estate does to people and that became very apparent through this application process which is in itself a, a, a kind of archive of all of these artists from across the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of going through all of that information, part of what we're, we're trying to design out now is what we're calling the Center for Art and Advocacy. And so we're very intentionally building out an academy incubator portion of this, which will have a curriculum that can be adopted by any museum or institution across the country to work with people with, within, within proximity in their own communities. Um, and the other facet of this is a residency program to actually provide people with space and time to be free, to, to be creative. Because to me, to me, it's like imagination and creativity and kind of breaking out of of these kind of like punitive systems and like how we think is actually having the time and space to be able to think. And that's, it's very difficult out here in the world when you have to pay your bills, you just came home from prison, you have all, you have surveillance, you have all of these hooks in you. And we're trying to think very intentionally about like, how do we actually create a space for artists and advocates to actually be in community with each other? That is like our space and like just the freedom and kind of liberty to think right to strategize and dream and imagine um and so i bring i bring all that up because I, I feel like those are they're all kind of very interconnected things and so it's like how do we actually think about creating the systems and structures in opposition to like right, these punitive systems and so it's like really being intentional about building uh building out space for creativity. Thank you. I'd like to uh, address um, the, well, perhaps two questions, the question about education and the question about archives. It made me think about the work that Michelle Jones, who is currently a graduate yeah. student at NYU, but uh, who was incarcerated for, for over 20 years um, at the Indiana Reformatory for Women. I, I can't remember the exact title of the, of the institution. And she and some of her imprisoned colleagues uh, began to do work on the archives of that prison. Uh, and what they discovered uh, um, gave them the opportunity to write a journal article that completely disputed the um, conventional representation of uh, what had historically happened in that prison. Uh, uh, I mean, it was, it, it was quite remarkable that, uh, 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 you know, they were able to argue that the violence that was putatively not present in women's prisons uh, 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 was um, massive and systematic. Uh, you know, so, so this makes me think also about um, the, a struggle to bring education um, to people who are incarcerated. Uh, and, you know, perhaps not so much to bring education, because I think incarcerated people who are not necessarily formally um, educated uh, uh, have brought a very different kind of education um, uh, to those who are on the, on the outside. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'll, I have one example. My uh, former co-defendant, Rochelle McGee, uh, many years ago in 1970, uh, uh, talked about prisons, prisoners as slaves. Mm. And, um, 
you know, introduced uh, this notion of a connection between slavery and imprisonment that has since been researched and, and written about in, in so many ways. But the first time I encountered uh, uh, that um, analogy uh, was um, from someone who had not received a formal education. Uh, so it, 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 it helps us to um, recognize um, the nature of education and and how education uh, does not necessarily only happen uh, in institutions, formalized institutions of, of, of education. And it also, I think, uh, encourages us to do the work that needs to be done to guarantee that people who are in prison uh, can be given um, uh, the, the possibility of living um, the life of the intellect, uh, 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 which is the only way to experience freedom under those circumstances. Uh, and of course, it's the way we experience freedom, those of us who live in, 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 in the so-called free world as, as well. Um, uh, but I just, I, I would like to emphasize how much um, knowledge is incarcerated and how much intellect is incarcerated and how many dreams are incarcerated and how much vision is incarcerated. Uh, and this is, you know, why we as abolitionists argue uh, that uh, those who are on the inside need to be allowed to participate in the process of re uh, reimagining our entire society. Yeah. Could, could I add to that a little bit? Please, please. Answering some of the questions. So, um, I mean, Angela is pointing to something which I think we all need to reckon with, which is the irony of prison education, right? The people who've been denied access to education systematically throughout their young lives are the ones who are ending up inside. And yet, you know, my experience of going inside is meeting up with people who have read things I don't even know how they found half the time. I mean, I remember being a very young professor going to a prison in Alabama, and someone came running up to me, which is already funny because the idea that someone can run up to you inside was was um, weird, but it was only because the prison we were visiting had prisoners who were there from the time they were young and really the guards were unafraid of what their behaviors would be. So there was a lot of interaction um, inside the prison. And, you know, the people that I was talking to there felt like ideal students. And I thought, well, this is incredibly horrible that the way they've come to, to terms with the fact that they want this knowledge is by being denied access to the free world. So, we we definitely want to have these prison education programs, but they have to feed the other elements that I think were in those questions. Like, what are they doing spiritually? What are we doing? Are we thinking, as Angela's pointing out, that we're bringing the knowledge, or are we, you know, making repair for what we haven't done? And you know, what are some more inventive ways to deliver prison ab abolition that I mean, prison education that are in an abolitionist framework? Like, why can't people travel to be in classes? at universities or wherever, you know, they are. Um, it's happened in a few cases, but we think of that as completely um, untenable. But really, we should be using education programs to facilitate decarceration and to make it possible for people to have broader interactions in community in a safe way that can benefit everyone. Um, what we don't want are, are programs that allow people to suppress other people's spiritual growth. And that sometimes happens with prison education programs. And so now I'm I'm thrilled that people are really reconsidering this and thinking deeply about what it means and and what it is, who's offering what and um and who's taking what. And part of that is also thinking about these archives. So, you know, I as a as a scholar, I sometimes find archives funny because it's the stuff that's not there a lot of times that you want. And the stuff that mm -hmm. that is there is often strange. I mean, I think about my own, you know, desk, you know, what's here is what I'm not paying attention to half the time. So, you know, what does it mean to think about archives? So, 
when we think about incarceration, we need to think about what are the forms of archives that actually can be built? And then also what will never be there and how can we document this absence, which is why I think art is so important because often it can call attention to that which we don't have access to in another way and remind us of the structure of what we're seeing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see um, uh, something beautiful happening. There's um, uh, someone named uh, Rodney Spivey Jones, who's very active in the chat. He just said, books, knowledge, new ideas circulate like heirlooms in prison. And uh, he asks me a question. I'm a graduate of the Bard Prison Initiative and author of Black Disfigurement and the American Hieroglyphics of Race. Question, what role impact does the scholarship of incarcerated people have on your work? And what I want to say to that, Rodney Spivey Jones, is that uh, in the beautiful, beautiful movie uh, about uh, about the bar Bard, uh, a college at Bard, um, I did a panel conversation with your sister and I said, I didn't even know she was your sister. And I was like, who's that genius over there talking about these things that I've been writing about for a long time, talking about uh, race and spectacle and racialized violence and, 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 and the, you know, the insistence of race and uh, accompanying violence at the center of our national spectacle and trauma. You were talking about that. That's what I write about. She said, that's my brother. You were still inside. I understand you're out now. And I want to read your book uh, that you've written and uh, exchange work. But it's um, very beautiful to see you ask that question as we're having this conversation and thinking about um, the movement of um, ideas and knowledge um, and the things that we are trying so hard to make a contribution to make things better. So I see you and I'm excited. Um, we're just about at time. So why don't we uh, go around and uh, each of you please leave us with, um, with you know, anything. We haven't gotten to so much. We've gotten to so much. I see all that's happening in this beautiful chat. So I wish we could have gotten to all the questions, but um, closing thoughts uh, from each of you, please. Uh, one term that I want to leave us with is uh, at risk. Uh, and I can remember uh, going to an at risk youth program. And I think that that, you know, when we think about the prison industrial complex or mass incarceration, if we look back just a little further, well, we have our at risk youth. And so I hope that some of these same resources and pedagogies and interventions are happening at the level before we actually get to incarceration, because I think that's also part of it. And I would say in terms of the uh, uh, oral histories that, you know, obviously to look at the WPA project of enslaved people and to look at the history makers, because there are precedents, you know, maybe they're not the greatest ones or uh, those are great. But I think, you know, anything that we um, uh, endeavor, we should go back and look at what the you know, the exemplars are in that field. And so I hope whoever is wants to do this oral history work is going to look at the exemplars and not just starting out blindly. Thank you. And I, I think, um, you know, one closing closing thought for me would be um, like when, when we think about kind of building building a movement, right? And thinking about kind of collective power. I think it's, I think it's worth saying it's like, it's really important to um, not just focus on like individual figureheads, right? Who are kind of like very charismatic. They come with kind of like preformed ideas. It's like a very easy thing to, to kind of support and get behind and amplify. Um, but I think it's I think it's really important to think about cultivating new leaders and actually like building movement and building power, um, specifically when we're talking about people who have been incarcerated. Um, and so I, I just think that's that's a very important part of of how we're actually going to create new leaders, sustain the movement, bring more people into it and also create more proximity. Right. Because going back to thinking about like how I'm in Philadelphia and people are having these conversations and I go back to Lancaster and they're not necessarily having these conversations. 
but they're they're equally impacted across the country, right? Lancaster is just reflective of every other kind of small city and rural community across the country. And it's like, how do we actually create and cultivate leaders all over the country that create proximity and allows that language, whether it's visual or written or whatever the creative kind of language is, that allows people to come into this movement and, and actually express and create empathy and create connection. Because I've experienced that a lot. Like I've I've talked in different communities, I've screened the films in different places. Um, and, you know, every time people come up to me and they always say, oh, my, such and such was incarcerated, my brother, my sister, my son, uh, we just don't talk about it. And so, you know, there's, it's just like, it's so saturated at this point in this country, but it's like, how do we, how do we cultivate new leaders so that we are actually um, creating space for, for this conversation to happen everywhere? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, you know, just to, to build on what Jesse just said, I mean, we're in a time where we're so cynical about leadership, right? Every time someone's in a leadership position, it becomes just time to attack. And I think Jesse's really gotten to something. It makes me think about how, you know, we've trans transitioned in this moment to talking about leaderful movements, some feminist principles that are behind that. And I think those are really important to bring out. I'm just thrilled to be a part of a conversation that's indicative that for those of you who are struggling and feeling hopeless about what's going on to know that over time with hard work attention can come to these issues and we can take advantage of this moment and then we also know we have to survive another moment <laughs> when there'll be um those who are turned against us again and I, i'm thinking right now of lifting up the dream defenders in in florida another organization doing incredible work and one of the things they're doing now in response to DeSantis is book banning and other things is distributing free books and you know they've consistently been focused on um radical education and community education and and building leaders and i'm thrilled that all of these leaders are being built and i hope it's not on a celebrity model and i hope that we know that we're going to have to survive through many, many decades, hopefully in our lives where um, we may be attacked for this work, but we know that there's a greater and more sustaining community around us to continue. And I'm I'm thrilled to know that these energies from Mellon and from you, Elizabeth, and from others here on the on the call are going into this work. And I, I know there are going to be generations behind us and we'll need them. Thank you. Um, yeah, this has been a wonderful conversation. And um, what I would like to emphasize um, is that um, as we imagine freedom, um, it's important not to assume that freedom is a destination, but that freedom mm -hmm. is actually a process. It's actually the journey. And in that context, and I'm smiling now because I can remember when it really was not possible to have conversations like this, uh, when even people who were most affected by uh, the violence of, of, of prison systems were afraid uh, to talk about uh, prisons except as a place where all of the criminals are. And we've come so far since then. And, and, and that's an indication of, of how we can be successful in our journey uh, 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 for freedom and our journey that incorporates the impulse uh, uh, toward freedom, which, which will be an infinite uh, journey. Um, but again, thank all of you so much. I so appreciate uh, your uh, contributions. And thank you so much, Elizabeth, uh, uh, for creating uh, this, this amazing opportunity. Thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. This has been extraordinary. Thank you, everybody out there for, uh, for coming, for, for participating, for engaging. Um, we do have another event scheduled soon that we hope you'll come back for. Uh, why does affirmative action still matter? On Thursday, March 16th at 4 p.m. with Sherilyn Eiffel, Stuart Quo, and Melissa Murray. Um, so we hope that you will join us for that. 
But to our 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 guests today, um, thank you, and and to all of you, may uh, our hearts uh, grow ever larger in compassion and connection. Thank you all so much. All right, I'm rolling. Let's go. Are you ready, kid? I'm ready. You know, whenever I think about all the struggles and strife I've been through in my life, it's truly hard to comprehend. I mean, I'm sitting inside a cage on death row, yo. So far away from home. So far away from everything I know. Might as well be sitting inside the hold of a spaceship. That's what it feels like to be here. Yet it's hard sometimes to see how what I'm going through is connected to what my ancestors suffered and survived. Truth be told, I'm lucky to be alive, real talk. Sometimes when things get too heavy to carry, I close my eyes and drift back to a time when everything was all good. A time when it was fully understood that being here on this earth the biggest blessing. My grandfather taught me that. See, I grew up in a neighborhood called The Village. A small enclave on the east side of Cleveland. A beautiful place, yo. With fruit trees and sweet things on every corner. No lie. I was surrounded by my family and friends. And I'm telling you, there was no end to the love we shared. A real community planned by people whose only plan was to live and give everything they had. They gave it all. Children of slaves who braved the worst of it. So we, the children and grandchildren, could make the most of it. Yeah. You know, to shield us from the pain of knowing the truth, they never explain what kind of society we were born in. They didn't tell us about all the tricks and traps that were designed to re-enslave or about the hate that could deliver us to an early grave. They wanted us to be free. They wanted us not to see all the ugliness around us. So a lot of us got caught up in the darkness and lost the light that was meant to guide us through. We gotta tell the children the truth. Tell them it's not what they say, but what they do. Tell them the real about reality. That life isn't meant to be fair, that it's meant to be lived. Tell the children the truth. Yeah. Thank you.